This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. What does it mean to be musical? 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 What does it mean? What does it mean to be musical? Why is music such a potent form of human expression? How do musicians select, interpret, and perform compositions? What's distinctive about the human voice? We've asked six extraordinary scholars and artists to explore the magic that is music. stop there and first I'd like to welcome you all and thank you all for coming and thank you Alan and Steve for inviting me. And I'd like to take a moment and ask you to think about the bit of music I just played and what it conveyed to you. And I think it would be fascinating if we had time for everyone to write down what the music, what you felt, what that communicated to you because I think we'd get a huge range of responses because everyone hears music differently, and we all listen for different things in music. But considering that the composer wrote at the top of the score, molto espressivo, I would hope that you all felt that the music was in some way expressive. Even if you don't all agree about what it was that was being expressed, or for that matter, are able to put into words what that was. Stravinsky once famously said, music is powerless to express anything at all. And he got so much flack for that comment that he had to go back and revise it. And he said, well, what he meant was that music can't be expressed in words. And music is nonverbal, and that it would be absurd for a composer to have a correlation between feelings, his feelings, and the notation in his music. He finally summed up with a memorable expression, music expresses itself. So my lecture this evening will examine this subject of expression in music through the lens of Beethoven's highly personal late style, focusing on one work, the piano sonata in A-flat major, opus 110. I aim to demonstrate how the tools of the composer's craft, that is, melody, harmony, counterpoint, form, can be used to give music expressive content. So we will spend the next hour in the world of Beethoven's Sonata 110, and also in my world. So I think that will give you a sense of my focus and my process as a performer. So getting back to that fragment of music, which was in fact the entire first theme of the sonata, I have to ask, when we hear late Beethoven, are we influenced by what we know about Beethoven's life? In 1821, when he wrote this music, 
he was almost totally deaf and in very poor health. The fact that he was able to produce these profound late works at such a troubled time in his life is inspiring. And the romantic view of the heroic artist struggling to go on remains attractive today. On the other hand, Beethoven's letters from the time reveal a character who was not particularly heroic. Uh, these letters are dominated by three themes. Complaints about his terrible intestinal problems and diarrhea, and his search for a good doctor, which unfortunately he never found. Worries about money and fears that his publishers were ripping him off. And finally, the tragic and disastrous efforts to be a mentor and a father to his troubled nephew, whom he had adopted. Now, I would agree that there is something ineffable about great art. There is some magical quality which resists analysis and has to be called inspiration. However, I would also argue that training, effort, and craft are an essential part of the mix, even if they make for a less compelling storyline. After all, Beethoven, with his increasing deafness, could not have continued to compose without the ability to hear music in his head, an ability not unique to Beethoven, but in fact a skill which was learned, cultivated, and mastered by the great composers who came before him. Though his letters reveal him to be all too human, Beethoven was fully aware of his own genius and his place in the pantheon of great composers. To some extent, he feeds the romantic view of the artist hero by writing works in which the very struggle to create becomes a general theme of the music. You will hear it in this sonata, and even more clearly you can hear it in the last string quartet, written in 1826, the year before his death. Here, in the last movement, he alternates between two musical ideas, which he actually sets words to. Muss es sein? Muss es sein? Must it be? And es muss sein. It must be. It must be. Now, those words are written in the score. They're meant to be seen by the performers. The audience will not hear them unless they're following a score. They'll, they can read them. So the struggle continues throughout the movement between these two ideas. Must it be? It must be. And finally, in the end, that joyful es muss sein wins out. What es is, what it is, is left unclear, whether it is the desire to go on living or just the will to complete the work uh, is left in, up in the air. Some people think there was a little humor in this, but I, I think of it as something a little more serious. In John Ashbery's great poem about music, Syringa, he writes, and I quote, the way music passes, emblematic of life, and how you cannot isolate a note of it and say it's good or bad. You must wait till it's over. I find this to be a profound observation about music, the idea of music being emblematic of life in the way it passes. And one of the pleasures of attending a concert is the collective experience of the way music passes. Ashbery is also right when he says that you must wait till it's over before judging. So in this talk, I will, in fact, isolate a few notes and a few phrases, but I promise you that at the end, I will finish with an uninterrupted performance of the entire sonata. So now I'd like to talk in some detail about the first movement of the sonata. Like practically every other first movement of a classical sonata, string quartet, or symphony, it is in what's called sonata allegro form. That means that's a, a set a set existing template. So that means that you, it's reasonable for you to come to this with a certain set of expectations. You can expect a large 
three-part form with an exposition, a development, and a recapitulation. And that exposition will contain a first theme, a transition, a second theme, and a closing theme. Now, in Mozart, these sections would be presented with crystal clarity. You would have a first theme, you'd have a transition, that first theme would end, neat, nice little cadence. Then you'd have a transition, then you'd have a contrasting second theme in the dominant. Closing theme. And a coda. Very clear. That would be an exposition in a Mozart sonata. Here, in just two minutes of music, this is a very concise sonata, the sections flow together, giving an impression of fleeting ideas and shifting emotions. The mood is almost improvisatory, like a stream of consciousness. Here's the entire exposition of the Sonata First Movement. Now, Beethoven was far more specific in his directions to the performer than anyone had ever been before. He not only marks at the beginning of the score, moderato cantabile molto espressivo, moderate tempo, singing, very expressive. He also writes in Italian, con amabilità, and in German, sanft, meaning to play in a character of gentle amiability. Finally, every bar is full of information about phrasing and dynamics. For example, the crescendo in bar three leading to a sudden drop back down to piano, to a soft uh, dynamic. That's a device that Beethoven favored throughout his career. Now dynamics, that is soft and loud, piano and forte, and everything in between as well, Certainly, that, that, that's part of musical expression. And a surge of a dynamic intensity 
can seem to indicate a surge of emotion. Dynamic markings of any kind, however, in Bach and before are rare. And Mozart and Haydn mostly trusted to their performers to apply dynamics tastefully. However, for Beethoven, dynamics were a carefully thought out element of the composition, which he wanted to control. So, for example, here's that crescendo leading to a sudden drop at, right at the beginning. The first theme, which you've now heard twice, uh, has two parts to it. The first four bars, I feel, evoke speech more than song. It's a melody that's pretty jagged. It, it skips down, up, down, up, gets to a high note, which it circles around, and then arrives at a trill and a tiny little cadenza, which is like a little moment of improvisation. Now, this melody is harmonized in a four-part texture that easily could have been the beginning of a string quartet. But whereas a string quartet, the members have to work very hard to match and blend the sound of each of their instruments, a pianist starts off with a homogenized sound, with a, a homogenous sound, and has to work to differentiate the voices. So in addition to bringing out that top line as the primary voice, I want to bring out the bass line, which is the cello part, especially since it exactly mirrors the top line. The middle voices are less interesting, except in the third bar, the tenor suddenly has a beautiful counter melody. So I have to bring that out as well. I have to listen for that. So the question of how to, how to balance a chord is always an issue every time, anywhere in this sonata. You have to decide what voice to bring out, but also relative to the other voices, really every voice should have its own, its own quality. Now, part two of, the, of this first theme is more song-like, melody and accompaniment. And this part consists of three phrases. The first one leads to an expressive dissonant note, which I like to lean on. The second phrase has the same rhythm but moves in the opposite direction. Like an answer. And the third phrase is longer. It begins the same as the first, moving to an expressive dissonant note, but then it continues on to another dissonant note, which is also the high point of the phrase. That crescendo arrives, unlike the first one, which didn't get, to, it, it, it didn't arrive at, at, at a, it, it dropped back down to piano. So it's satisfying to have a crescendo at the end of the first theme that really gets to where it's going. I'd like to mention two elements to listen for in Beethoven's melodic melody lines. The first is syncopation. Right there already, we, and you'll see it, you'll hear it throughout. And the other is his favoring melodies with extremely large leaps, which you'll hear in theme two. Now to talk about harmony, harmonically these two themes are related. 
they begin with the same two chords. But the broader point to mention is that Beethoven liked to limit his harmony to just those two chords, tonic dominant, one and five. In tonal music, there's a whole hierarchy of chords to choose from, of which tonic and dominant are the most important. But Beethoven had a lifelong fascination with this binary approach to harmony. And it feels as if he was challenging himself to do more with less. Of course, we're all used to this idea of uh, the possibilities of a binary approach living as we do in the, in the computer age. So we, we know that it's limitless what you can do with zeros and ones. And Beethoven could do it, go a long way with just one and five, just toggling back and forth with limitless patterns. Stravinsky made the point that adding restraints gave him a feeling of increase of freedom that the, he, his freedom came from his restraints. And I think that Beethoven, by distilling his harmony down to just two chords, is, is part of what makes the harmony so powerful. So after this first theme that you've heard a couple of times now, dominated as it is by one chord and five chords, we have a remarkable transition whose harmony is also dominated by one chord and five chords. In fact, starts with the same two chords. What I love about this transition is the way the melody evaporates, leaving only the texture of the right hand arpeggios. In a subtle touch, Beethoven adds staccato dots on the octaves. So. Not accents, but just little staccato dots. So as expected, this transition modulates to the dominant, to E flat major. And the old five chord becomes the new one chord. It also leads to the second theme, which is less like a theme and more like a series of fragments. If I describe it in words, you'll see how changeable this music is. So the second theme starts with a little two-voice duet, tranquil, tender, Jagged like the first theme, but with larger intervals, with the lower voice gently imitating the upper voice. That brings us to a, a string quartet texture again, which then pulls apart with trills in the left hand going down and broken chords in the right hand going up, reaching a big arrival, a huge leap down in the right hand melodically, followed by a dynamic thrusting music with the hands moving in contrary motion. Suddenly the mood changes, becomes classical, almost prim, followed by a large upward leap, a kind of vertiginous scale going back down, and then a lyrical closing theme and a little coda. That's a lot of material for a short span of time. As I play it through, you can hear how these shifting musical ideas flow whether smoothly connecting or in opposition to one another. So much better 
on the piano than in a description with words. <laughs> so it's interesting how all, somehow all these disparate elements fit together. But well, what does it mean? Is it emblematic of life or of thought? Or as Stravinsky said, does it just express itself? The development section, which follows, is unusually compact. As all development sections do, it modulates to other keys, and it also combines various elements from the exposition. I think that venturing away from the home key can be seen as a metaphor for leaving one's actual home, wandering off in unfamiliar directions. And the farther away harmonically, the farther away geographically. The design of this development section is elegantly simple. The right hand repeats the first two bars of the movement, 18, eight times, sorry, not 18, eight, eight times, each time in a different key. As the harmony changes, the expressive quality of this little motive changes. And you can hear that if you compare the first two bars of the exposition with the first two bars of the transition. The left hand starts out with the accompaniment taken from the second half of theme one. But then it takes the scale elements from theme two. And puts them into a conversation between a rather placid baritone line and a more agitated bass line. For me, the pleasures of this development section are in the contrapuntal skill of combining all these elements, in the harmonic uncertainty of wandering, and in the anticipation of the recapitulation, which will bring back both the return of the home key and the complete theme one, not just the first two bars. So I'll now play the entire development. At the end, there's a trill which signals that we're about to arrive at the recapitulation and the return of theme one in A flat major, our, our home key. As you listen, your ear may be drawn to that conversation in the left hand, or you may focus on the colors that change with the harmonies in the right hand as it repeats over and over again that short motive. When I play it, I try to listen to all those elements of this complex texture at the same time. So I invite you to try to do that as well. That's a beautiful recapitulation. They usually are. It's usually one of those great moments. And in this case, what Beethoven does is instead of just bringing it back the way we first heard it, he takes the transition arpeggios and inverts them and puts them in the left hand. So we get, we, they become an accompaniment figure to the returning first theme. At this point, what we would expect 
was that this entire exposition would be repeated. Only this time, theme two, instead of being in a different key, would be in the, sa in the home key. The whole thing would be in A flat major. But Beethoven does not do that. He changes things up. So for instance, theme one appears which, in the tenor register, in the left hand, which hadn't happened before. Also, even though the recapitulation starts in the correct key of A flat major, it, it very quickly wanders off and arrives at a very distant key of E major. So theme two begins in a very wrong key, four sharps instead of four flats. It's kind of lost. Beethoven corrects this very simply by sliding down half step at a time until he arrives at the correct key. So. As if to, to let everyone savor that moment, as we approach theme two in the correct key, he writes in a ritenuto. He writes to sort of stretch out the, the rhythm a little bit, just so we can savor it. This movement ends with a coda, which contains new treatments of material from the exposition. So that reinforces the idea of hearing this whole movement as a single narrative. Like the second theme, this coda feels like a progression of beautiful fragments with an extension of the closing figure of the exposition, followed by a passage of very still, almost static chords to the arpeggio figure again from the transition to one last fleeting farewell of the open theme, of the opening theme in the tenor with new counterpoint and some very beautiful expressive new harmony. I'll just play that part. So the melody is in the tenor. So when you're only using one five, one five, and then you, you have a chord like this, it has even more impact. But it happens very quickly. He, he kind of throws it away at the end of the movement. And uh, you have to be listening for it. just kind of melts away. I think this movement does have an overall feeling of amabilita, of amiable serenity. But I also think, to my ear, there's, there are darker undercurrents this, of restless energy, which is something I appreciate about this music. Now, this sonata is cyclical. And the second movement flows right out of the first. It, it begins on the same note that the first movement ended on. The second movement is scherzo, which is the Italian word for joke or trick. Now, Beethoven's scherzi often go beyond the playful wit of his predecessors. In fact, some of his contemporaries were a little dismayed by the broadness of his humor, finding it perhaps coarse or even low class. Even today, some of his jokes are pretty startling. If you take the scherzo, for instance, from the very last string quartet, opus 135, it begins with the, the four members of the quartet playing music that just blithely skipping along, and then just suddenly rams into a brick wall of uncontrollable stuttering. <laughs> what he wrote. <laughs> I, I was dumbfounded when I first heard that. And as, as you can imagine, uh, so were people in 1826. <laughs> this scherzo incorporates two folk tunes. 
Beethoven sent the first one to his publisher in 1820 with his own accompaniment. Beethoven wrote a little accompaniment to it, and he jokingly offered it as payment for postage. And he wrote in also the words of this tune, which were a bit of doggerel verse, something to the effect of, our cat has had kittens, three and six, nine. One of them has a mark on its head. That one will be mine. So that folk song goes like this. Which in the scherzo becomes a kind of call and response. The other little tune is a, a folk song to the words of Ich bin Ludelich, du bist Ludelich, uh, which is evidently quite difficult to translate. Uh, something like, I am slovenly, you are slovenly. <laughs> which becomes. Now, this scherzo is in the traditional form of all scherzi, uh, ABA form, with a binary outer sections and a contrasting trio in the middle. Beethoven's trios can be quite startling. Again, one of my favorites is uh, another example from that final string quartet. Here, the three lower strings arrive at the following figure. which they repeat 48 times. <laughs> and while they're doing that, the first violin wildly leaps up and down. Well, it's exuberant maybe a little bit mad, and most listeners at the time were completely baffled. While not quite that weird, the trio in Opus 110 is still hard to get a handle on. And when I first learned this piece 35 years ago, it gave me a lot of trouble. The pitches in the right hand do not seem to make any sense. If I play it slowly for you, I think you'll hear what I mean. That's a very unconventional treatment of dissonance. To make it even uh, stranger, the left hand is almost entirely made up of offbeats, and then the two hands cross in the middle. So, <laughs> I, no doubt, when you hear it, hear it in context, you will interpret it each in your own way. Uh, to me, it has a somewhat unhinged quality. It's, uh, it's a little bit like Bart Simpson falling down a flight of stairs. Six times in a row. Because that, that's what this trio does. It just repeats this falling cascade, which is an eight-bar figure, six times. And in the middle, there are three extra bars just to keep, thing off, keep things off balance. So clearly, this movement has humorous qualities. At the same time, there are moments that you may, in which you may detect a little bit of a harder edge. For instance, in violent interruptions like this one. It's Beethoven grabbing us and shaking us. Well, the scherzo. leads directly into a drastic change of mood with bleak, funereal, almost baroque sounding chords setting the stage for a recitative. Here, the score has very precise instructions for the performer. 
about the use of the pedals, both the sustaining pedal, which lifts all the dampers, and the una corda, the soft pedal, which shifts the action over so the hammers hit fewer strings. There's also a very unusual repeated note figure in which two notes are tied together, but then at the same time, there's a change in fingering on the second note. So I interpret this as a kind of throbbing effect, like the keening cry on a single note. I'll play that. Just as in an operatic recitative, or one in a religious work by Bach, say, this recitative leads to an aria, wordless, wordless, of course, but described in the score in both Italian and German as a mournful song. It consists of just four eloquent phrases. And it's worth following that anguished single melody line closely. And my challenge as a performer is to sustain that long, slow, melodic line. I won't play it now, but I would like to point out that the opening phrase derives from the first four bars of the scherzo. So. Even in that little fragment, you could hear first rhythmic syncopation and also a very expressive use of dissonance. At this point, the sonata's large scale form becomes a part of its expressive landscape. The arioso dolente, or the song of mourning, brings the work to a very low point at its ending, which could be viewed as a kind of surrender to despair. And at this moment in the form, Beethoven chooses to, to write a fugue. Now, a fugue is a very old contrapuntal form in which a melodic subject, single line, is developed by a number of voices which move independently. And fugues are difficult. They require a lot of skill to compose, and they evoke the past. So when it appears here, it feels to me as if Beethoven is drawing strength from the old masters, especially Bach, while also taking his place in this great tradition. There is something moving about a single hopeful line quietly rising out of the ashes of the slow movement. That line happens to be derived from the very first theme of the sonata. So. becomes the working out of this fugue feels like the working out of a depressed mood it starts serenely but later when it appears in a minor key it feels like a struggle to move forward and finally towards the end Beethoven uses a device that Bach favored called stretto, in which the entrances overlap. So first, first he uses it with two voices. And then at the end, with all three voices, starting with the bottom, the, the bass, and then the middle voice, and the upper voice, all overlapping. And that's the climax of the fugue. And my job here is to bring out that subject whenever it, it appears, whether it's on the top voice, the middle voice, or the bottom voice, but also 
to try to listen to all three voices and phrase each one independently. Surprisingly, the sonata does not end with this beautiful fugue. Instead, the mournful song reappears. This time, the mood is even bleaker. So Beethoven does something here that, which is, was unheard of at the time. He transposes the entire thing down a half a step, making the sound literally darker. And the melody is broken up as if gasping. Beethoven writes here in the score, in German and Italian, the words exhausted, losing strength. So my challenge here is to somehow project weakness, which is a sort of an oxymoron. And this is what operatic sopranos have to do when they portray the role of a, a heroine with advanced lung disease. <laughs> so as the aria ends, the fugue does emerge again. Only this time, the subject is inverted. And that arching subject when inverted, becomes a trough. That's another technique that Bach used. So as the music builds here, the instructions to the performer from Beethoven are to start very softly and under tempo and bit by bit come to life bring it to life. So as Beethoven builds this music to a kind of life-affirming return to A-flat major, he seems to revel in his own compositional virtuosity as he brings the fugal subject back at double speed and at half speed and mixes the original subject with the inverted subject simultaneously. Finally, the original subject arches higher and higher, reaching upward in a triumphant apotheosis. For me, this lavish display of compositional technique coming after a tragic and disintegrating aria is Beethoven's musical way of saying, it was music that saved me from despair. It was my art that enabled me to keep going. Well, you now have a sense of, of how I hear this work. And I've pointed out a number of things to listen to. But as I play the sonata all the way through, please feel free to listen in your own way. <laughs> After all, there's no wrong way to listen to music. The very non-specificity of musical expression means that each listener can interpret it differently to suit his or her frame of mind. Thankfully, as Beethoven proved again and again, a vagueness as to the particular meaning of a piece of music doesn't lessen the intensity of the expression.